All right, in this video, I want to talk more about the t-distribution. Specifically, what I want to do is show you how you can do hypothesis testing when you have a t-distribution. The big idea with the t-distribution is that everything that you learn in the past is reliant upon knowing the population standard deviation sigma. All of the inverse norm, normal CDF, z interval, z test stuff that we've done so far, we needed to know sigma, the population standard deviation. And it turns out, unfortunately, often it's unrealistic to know the population standard deviation. And it's much more realistic to calculate the sample standard deviation, S. And there's a downside to using S in place of sigma in these problems. And it's that your distribution that is now relevant is the T distribution and not the Z distribution. So you can't do things like Z interval. You instead have to do something like T interval like we did in the last video. Similarly, you can't do a Z test. You instead have to do a T test, which is what we're going to do in this example. So let's come up with an example. Um, the average height for an adult male. I just Googled this. I spent all of, I don't know, 30 seconds looking this up. Is, what did it say? Five foot six. So that's 66 inches. It is 66 inches. All right, let's suppose that's known. We have this population average baseline value. The average height for an adult male is 66 inches. In a random sample of, I don't know, let's say um, of uh, 81 teenagers, the average height. Was, should we make them taller, shorter? It doesn't matter. Let's say 68 inches with a standard deviation of, I don't know, eight inches, fine. I'm making up some numbers here. We'll see how this works out. Um, suppose you're given all this information and then you are asked, test the claim that all teenagers, the average height of all teenagers is more than or are taller than than test the claim that teenagers are taller than average sure um, assume what should we say let's say 95 percent that's a popular choice certainty or confidence or whatever significance um, you're given this problem right here this is a t-test example because we're asked to test some sort of claim if you go reading through the problem, looking for the information that is given, the average height for an adult male is 66 inches. This is a population average. It's the baseline that we'll be comparing things against. In the past, we used the symbol mu naught for this value, and we're still going to. Mu naught is still 66 here. And then we have this random sample of 81, and our sample size used to be the letter N, still is. The average height within our sample, this used to be X bar, still is. So far, everything is the exact same where things changes right here. This standard deviation is not referring to all adult males. It's instead only referring to these 81 teenagers. So this eight is not a sigma. It couldn't be a sigma. It's not talking about the population. It's just talking about the, the sample. This is S, not sigma. That's important. S is eight. I don't know how to draw attention to that. This is very important. Not sigma is eight, S is eight. Right now, it's not too bad because you're like, oh, I'm in the t-test section. Of course, they're going to give me s. But on the final exam, you'll have to read these really carefully, and it'll be super important that you recognize that that's s and not sigma. Anyways, test the claim that teenagers are taller than. So that's going to tell me it's a right-tailed test. And then it looks like we have 95% certainty. So that would tell me alpha is 5%. And maybe I'd ask you to do that by following the steps below. And then in the first step, I'd ask you to state the null and alternative hypotheses. And you'd be really happy if they're identical to what they used to be because you spent all that time learning those in 4.3. Good news, they are. You used to always compare mu and mu naught. Mu was just the symbol. Mu naught was a number given to you in the problem. The null hypothesis is that the average height of, your, of the population for which your sample is representative, the average height of all teenagers, is just the same as the average height for all adult males is 66. That's the skeptical point of view. But your claim is that the average height for all teenagers is more than 66. That's what makes them taller than average. So this would be a right tail test. In the past, I asked you to state and justify the shape, the center, and the spread of the distribution. I'm telling you, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to skip that. I could ask you to. I mean, you could still do it. 
you would say that the shape is following a T distribution. And the reason it's following a T distribution, well, my sample size is large enough and is greater than or equal to 30. So that means I don't care about the shape of the parent distribution. Nowhere in here does it say that the height of a male is normally distributed or something. Um, but it doesn't matter as long as n is greater than or equal to 30. However, this used to tell us that it was a Z distribution or normally distributed, but that only works if you know sigma. Since sigma is unknown, we'd have a T distribution. And for the center, you used to make note of the center with mu naught, you still do. Mu naught is equal to 66. And for the spread, you used to, since we're talking about a sampling distribution, say it was sigma divided by the square root of n. It couldn't possibly be sigma divided by the square root of n because we don't know sigma here, but we do know s. So the spread of this t distribution is s divided by the square root of n. s was, what did I say, 8? And n is 81. So what, 8? That's not an 8. I just made it worse. Uh, 8 ninths would end up being the spread. But what you'll see is I'm not going to ask you to do all this because you proved to me that you can do all that in the previous section. I just want you to kind of understand why we're t-distribution now and that s is the relevant statistic as opposed to sigma being the relevant parameter. Step two is where I asked you to draw the picture. And this used to be a lot of work in the past because in the past this could be the classical picture or the p-value picture. It's going to turn out that I'm going to always ask you to do the p-value picture. One could do the classical method here, but we're never going to do the classical method in chapter five. In chapter four, I want you to be able to do both methods. In chapter five, you only have to do the p-value method. Why? I have two answers. Answer number one is p-value is kind of the more expert case. It goes a little bit quicker. It's what most people use in practice. The advantage of the classical method is supposed to be more intuitive. So it's more of a beginner method. We're experts. We're in chapter five. We're just going to do p-value. The other reason why is think about what you'd do if you were doing the classical method. If you're doing the classical method, your first step would be to shade in alpha, your rejection region, 5%. So you put that over on the right, and then you'd have to figure out your critical value. And in the past, to figure out the critical value, you hit second and then variables and chose inverse norm. Can't do that anymore. The reason you can't do that anymore is because the picture you're gonna draw is a T distribution, not a Z distribution. And inverse norm, the norm part of inverse norm, assumes that it's a Z distribution. So what you would need to use is the inverse T calculator function to figure out your critical value. However, some of you don't have the inverse T calculator function in your calculator. If you have an older calculator, this doesn't even exist. So in order to make this fair for everybody, I don't ever want you using inverse T. So I don't ever want you to have to find a critical value. So I never ask you to do the classical method. We will always just do the p-value method when we're in chapter five. So as a reminder, the way you run the p-value method is you draw your distribution. You're drawing a t-distribution down here, not a z-distribution, but really they look the same to our bad art or whatever, it doesn't matter. Here's your t-distribution. For the center, you're gonna put in a zero here to represent zero of these spreads above or below the center. Remember with hypothesis testing, you always use normalized values down on the bottom here. And then all you need is your test statistic and your p-value, and those come straight out of your calculator. They used to come out of the z-test calculator function. They're not going to anymore because if you use z-test, you have to tell your calculator what sigma is. And sigma is unknown in this problem. Because sigma is unknown, we can't use z-test. So what do we do instead? Well, it won't surprise you to learn that we use t-test. Just like instead of z-interval, we use t-interval in the last video. Instead of z-test in this video, we're going to use t-test. If you select t-test, same question about you can do it with data or statistics. We'll start with just statistics. It'll ask you for mu naught, which was 66 in this problem, x bar, which was 68 in this problem. And then here's the big one that's important. It asks you for s, not sigma, because if, it's a, if you know s, instead of sigma, it's a t distribution. s in this problem was given to us to be 8, n is 81, and our claim it was that mu is greater than mu naught, this third one. And what I've been telling you <clears throat> is to select draw instead of calculating time you use the p-value method. Still a good idea. It draws the distribution. Um, I'd be curious to know if it draws anything different since it's a t-distribution. It should. Probably does. I'm going to have to investigate that on my own. But whatever. You don't worry about that. It draws this picture. And it shades to the right of your test statistic. It tells you your test statistic. Note it used to say z equals something here. 
that Z reminded you that it was a Z distribution. It was a Z score in your Z distribution. It was the number of standard deviations above or below the mean in your Z distribution. Now it's a T. It's a T score if you want. It's the number of standard errors above or below the center that you are in this T distribution. It's T that equals 2.25 this time for your test statistic. P-value is still the same old P-value. It's the area they shaded in. In this case, it's like 1%, 1.36%. There's your p-value picture. It looks almost identical to how it used to look, except now you indicate your test statistic with the letter T instead of the letter Z. And then you make your conclusion. That's step three, because again, this step is optional. The way your conclusion used to look is identical to how it currently looks. You say three things. First, you'd say why you're coming to your conclusion. It's because my test statistic, which in this case is T equals 2.25, falls in the rejection region. All right, that's the first thing, why you're doing what you're doing. And what that means in terms of the null hypothesis, it means if you fall in the rejection region, there's sufficient evidence to reject the null. And if you're rejecting the null hypothesis, that means you're saying your claim is true. So you might say something like, so I can conclude that teenagers are taller than average. Much like we did in the last video, in this video, I gave you statistics about the data. Suppose, instead of giving you this paragraph you see here, this part, in a random sample of 81 teenagers, the average height was 68 inches with a standard deviation of eight males. I said something like, uh, you collect the above data on teenager height. And then I just give you this big list. I guess it would have 81 observations instead of 100. And the first teenager probably wouldn't be 45 inches tall. You know, maybe these would be numbers. Maybe you collect this data. Maybe the first person was 67, the first teenager. Next one was 64. Next one was 70 and so on, all the way until you get to your 81st observation, who was, I don't know, 59 or whatever. It doesn't matter. You have all this data. You don't have anything in this paragraph, just this data. Turns out that's fine. You can still do everything the exact same as you used to. You go stat, edit, type this all into a list. I'm not going to bother. And then stat, tests, t-test. And just tell it you have the data instead of the statistics. When I switch this from statistics to data, it'll be like, oh, you don't have the statistics. Well, then I'm not going to bother asking you x bar, s, and n. All right, watch those three disappear. It still needs to know mu naught. It still needs to know this baseline average that we're comparing it against. But that's still given. That's still 66. All you'd have to do is tell what list your data was in and then what your claim is, and then you can calculate or draw, and you can be done with this problem.